So today we're lucky to have Martin Gauss, the CEO of Air Baltic in the studio, and we will discuss the strategy of the company and how digitization impacts what we're going to do next. So when you think about Air Baltic and lots of change for the company, first there was COVID, then there was the war, and then from what I could see from outside, this had a huge impact on the strategy because you cannot take as many passengers from the east and you probably need to reconsider what is the role of Air Baltic in the nearby geography at least. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. So what was the impact and how do you see the mission for the company going forward for the next 10, 20 years? So the, the, the biggest impact actually was COVID. When COVID came, we, we were stopped flying mm -hmm. and then we did not know how long we would have to live with reduced capacities. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that COVID time, we left last spring. Um, that, that was the time when COVID was more or less over and you could see that that yeah. is, is, is coming to an end and we planned for that end of COVID to come back to old levels. Mm -hmm. And then the war broke out as, as a new challenge. And mm -hmm. the war had an immediate impact to Ukraine flying, which was 7% uh, of our revenues that stopped. Also not knowing at that time how long it would take. We didn't think that it would take a year. And uh, over time, then also Russia stopped, not only the direct traffic to and from Russia, but also the overflying. So many co problems together, while COVID was still impacting uh, us from the bookings. And then the Baltic special situation mm -hmm. was that the inbound flights to the Baltics, the, the bookings we had, especially from groups from the West in the summer last year, mm -hmm. they just canceled them because in the beginning of the war, mm -hmm. the Baltics in the Western media looked a little bit like a war zone. That also changed. But all of this led us to adjust all the time to a business where you normally lease an aircraft for 12 years and, and plan to work with the aircraft for 12 years. We took in COVID time a decision not to reduce the amount of aircraft coming in which was now very wise because mm -hmm. now there's a shortage of aircraft, but we didn't know at the time. But mm -hmm. uh, the, and in the wartime, we took a decision to have with these aircraft something to do. So we gave some of them to other airlines to fly uh, and earn money with other airlines. That is a strategy change to what we did before, but that is something which we now do also for the future because we found out that that is something we can do, adding more aircraft and have some of them fly for others. The rest of the business, we are exactly where we used to be, excluding the traffic uh, to Russia and Ukraine, because that we cannot do, but we excluded it from our business model now. So we offset it with more leisure flying, but we are growing now uh, at the same pace as we were growing before COVID and the war by having part of the business flying for others. So giving our aircraft to other airlines this year, mainly Swiss and Lufthansa mm -hmm. Group, but also in the future globally. And we will continue to grow, so we are back on the growth path with a strategy which is the same than before, mm -hmm. because passengers are returning, just excluding around 10% of our revenue, uh, which was coming, uh, the direct revenues from Russia and from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So we look like, say, 30, 40 years ago, yeah. so there would always be a tendency that every country would want to have its national carrier. And then you look at Ireland, there is Aer Lingus, yeah. but there is also Ryanair. You look at Norway, and then there is SIS, and then there is Norwegian. Uh, if we compare Europe to the US, probably we have a lot more uh, companies. Um, so how do you see the industry developing? And then in that respect, where would you know, Air Baltic take the passengers? So are we limited to the Baltics now without you know, the connection to Russia and Ukraine? Uh, how, how do we develop that? So we have uh, in Europe, because of many European states with a lot of national interests, two big differences to the US. For example, mm -hmm. the airspace in Europe is still not a common airspace. Every country controls its own airspace, and that's why we fly zigzag mm -hmm. in Europe, while in the US you have one airspace. The same with the countries. In the US you also have the states, but they don't have their, their, their national airlines anymore. We have the states, and they still, a lot of them, insist on having their own connectivity, their own national carriers. So that's different. Uh, in the Baltics, we now have only one national carrier, which is Air Baltic. Not that we wanted this, because we're the Latvian mm -hmm. national carrier, but we developed into, especially in Estonia, we're the number one carrier as well. We just developed into this. In Lithuania, we are the number one connectivity carrier, but we are not the number one market size, because they have 
low cost carriers there. Mm -hmm. Our market now, we, we, we went with one aircraft to Finland, Tampere, means mm -hmm. a base outside the Baltics. Our market is wherever connectivity is needed with the aircraft we have. And there is many places now uh, where we could just put aircraft and say, this is a place from where we offer that connectivity. We, we, we have a unique aircraft and a unique system mm -hmm. in our Baltic. If we take a country and, and, and uh, Slovenia is a small country, currently mm -hmm. no national carrier, mm -hmm. but they are thinking about uh, uh, the, their last carrier went bankrupt. They are not happy with their connectivity. That is, an, uh, that is a country where you, mm -hmm. Ljubljana, could just have an Air Baltic with a couple of airplanes and starting an operation to ensure that basic connectivity because it's needed for them as it is needed here. That's one example. And I could name you many airports in Europe where a smaller Air Baltic with the same aircraft, the same system would make a lot of sense because we did it in Estonia. It makes a lot of sense. There's no hub in Estonia. We're just flying 16 routes in Estonia, point to point, and one to Riga where people can transfer. It works. So we have shown that it works, but we focused only on the Baltics. That was the plan. And we, with only having 50 aircraft next year, we cannot go much further. When we order more aircraft in the future with new equity, then we can place aircraft also at other places where that kind of connectivity is needed because we reached a, a size where we can take our model also somewhere else. Maybe then it's not Air Baltic code, maybe it needs to be a wide label solution or it's even us doing it for another country or another group. But we have also a lot of interest from airline groups to work with them and do what we we have a unique asset with the Airbus A220, which can fly seven hours or very short sectors with only 150 seats. Mm -hmm. Very efficient aircraft. And that is unique. We have the most of them in the world at the moment. And if we continue exercising our options, we have also growth potential for the future. This sounds like a very interesting kind of plan, right? So we've built a very efficient airline in not the most uh, rich country in Europe, so we were forced to be efficient and now you're saying that you know we can use the same efficiency model uh, in other countries who are not as rich, so they need something that is you know very efficient. Yeah, it's, it's more uh, what's the competitive situation in mm -hmm. such countries. So the same here, we, we have competition, Orion S number one competitor, Visa, Norwegian, mm -hmm. um, Finero is also a competitor here. But if you have a very, uh, if the competition uh, on the connectivity side is not there, that means the low-cost carrier are just serving that airport mm -hmm. and doing some leisure flying. Each capital in Europe or each business center needs connectivity. And, and I think mm -hmm. that is in Europe understood in the center where we have mm -hmm. high-speed train systems, mm -hmm. but it's not understood in the countries which are at the periphery mm -hmm. of Europe. And this connectivity is vital for small and medium-sized businesses. Because tourism you can cover with the leisure flying a little, mm -hmm. but you cannot cover connectivity to major airports mm -hmm. and major business centers. Mm -hmm. That's why we are such a big impact to the Latvian GDP, because our, our, what we do, the amount of, of connectivity we offer, uh, we are not a, a leisure carrier. Yeah? We are ensuring connectivity to, to all major business centers in Europe and beyond. And that enables people to come here, but also enables Latvians or, or Baltic people to go out and this connectivity, not having a train system or not a functioning train system uh, for the next years, uh, the, the air, airline is the only way of going fast enough to reach the GDP of Europe. Yeah, because we, we here reach, there's a nice study done uh, by w one of the consulting companies which says if you take the car four hours around Riga, uh, you reach 0.2% of the European GDP. If you take it for eight hours around Riga, you reach 2% of the European mm. GDP. If you take a plane for four hours, you reach 100% of the European GDP. And that is what Air Baltic, what makes Air Baltic so strong here, because we, we, we build that, but it would also enable us to do what we do somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be as Air Baltic. You can take the example of Ljubljana, where they had Adria Airways, but they, they didn't make it. You could say, okay, can we can we have Air Baltic doing this for us, and we need to call it X Y Z. Um, so there is a potential uh, in a lot of places in Europe, in a growing Europe, where the infrastructure, especially um, on the on the train side, is not there, mm -hmm. where it is maybe now. If we look at Brussels and Germany, you don't do that because there you have a very good infrastructure on the ground. And then Air India made headlines. I think a couple of days ago, they have now the biggest uh, order for Boeing's and Airbus. Uh, so, which could make uh, India uh, kind of one of the 
most lucrative airspaces in the world, yeah. right? because it's already very competitive. Uh, it's a very big, you know, very fast developing country. They don't have the train system as yeah. developed as well developed as in China. They're very open. Um, so from that perspective, how does European uh, space and European companies, how do we look like in terms of, you know, global competition with the Americas and then uh, India and Asia? Uh, we, we in Europe, uh, we, we still have the airspace issue, which is one of the biggest ones, not mm -hmm. only for saving fuel, because that would deliver at least a 10% saving on fuel and time, mm -hmm. and it would take congestions in Europe out if we have a single European sky. So that's a big one where we have a disadvantage against the US. Um, the the air, airspace structure in, in, in India and Asia is different. We have an advantage in Europe, definitely, with our road system and train system, uh, um, looking at that. Mm -hmm. We do not have it here yet. We do not have it at some of the eastern states, but that will come, and I'm sure Europe does that well. Uh, road system, I think, is okay in Europe from, from most of the countries. The long-haul connectivity in Europe is good. We have a very good connectivity long-haul, but of course, with, with, um, we have to be careful in Europe of not uh, isolating ourselves with some of the European laws, if we look at the emission trading system, which applies to us, that carriers in the future, because it becomes more expensive to, to buy a ticket with a European mm. airline, are not then going to Gulf carriers and to, to take them and then fly from there. So competition for us uh, is the Gulf for Europe now, not, not for our Baltic, but for European carriers, is the carriers from the Gulf region. Uh, a Turkish airline, which is uh, having a hub outside Europe and, and having a lot of benefit before, because of that. Because the European airlines, the, the, the carriers which were taking the passengers around the world, uh, having a disadvantage air, airspace structure. Uh, we are not building any airports anymore in Europe because you cannot for environmental reasons. And we have um, um, an emission trading system and more laws coming, which are isolating Europe in the, in the perspective of aviation. If we now look at politics, they say that is good because we force the airlines to uh, change their um, equipment to new equipment. We force airlines to save fuel and, and buy new aircraft. That's all fine. The problem, if you only do it in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. you are having a disadvantage against uh, US and Asia. And looking at India, the, this year, I think they're going to be, they have for the first time more people than China. And uh, that is definitely yeah. a gross market. I just saw the, the, the statistics in Latvia about the, the birth rates, right? It's the lowest for lot 20 years. So there's the opposite. We have, uh, we have for the long 30 years, we have an issue, right? We, we are limiting ourselves with a lot of uh, laws, local laws, while on the other side, uh, the, the nations in Asia mainly coming and just ordering mega orders and, and developing their air infrastructure in a completely different way. Mm. We, um, we, Air Baltic is also in the European um, uh, Aviation Association together with the large airlines and, and in Brussels we are discussing this a lot uh, and, and we, we're trying to be heard at, uh, at the European Parliament. We have these sessions with them, but uh, the politics in Europe at the moment is very clear. We want to limit uh, aviation due to the emissions and we, we, want to, we want the airline industry to go faster to a new technology than it exists. Because we would mm. take today a hydrogen aircraft if it would be available, if but it it's not. Available, yes. yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's a disadvantage, mm -hmm. but today we're still in a good position because we have on the, on the infrastructure, on the ground, a functioning system in Europe, which mm -hmm. others still have to build. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the European airspace uh, and then are there any plans uh, for European Union Parliament to change it the, the, uh, it's it's very interesting since i'm in the industry we will have soon a single european sky yeah. uh, that's nearly 30 years uh, it is not happening because uh, the eu cannot agree the member states are insisting on their individual airspace structures not all of them but most mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. and therefore and that has also to do with the uh, defense and the military interests mm -hmm. of different states that the local uh, air navigation service providers in europe can't agree to have one common airspace which would be controlled by your control. And that causing this, this yeah, it's, a, it's a, around a 10% minimum fuel saving we would have if we would have a common airspace. Uh, we have an example for every summer in France, there is the summer strike of the French uh, air traffic controllers. Yeah, it's a standard thing. Mm -hmm. That means uh, you can't fly overfly France because the airspace is controlled by France. Mm -hmm. If you would have that in, in, an air, in a European, single European sky, you would just not be able to land in France, but you could still overfly. 
Yeah, but the whole of Europe going south, and then if you go to Spain or coming from the south, is suffering because of a strike, which is something locally in France each summer. And, and that is, is an example where all the travelers are affected because of these massive delays uh, we have because of an airspace which is only controlled by one country. Mm -hmm. So that, that the European um, single European sky, as it's called, uh, there is even an addi additional one uh, now 2.0, um, is not coming yet. But if you ask, it will be coming. And I hear this since I'm in the industry. Uh, we would love it uh, tomorrow, but uh, uh, it, it seems to be quite a way before we have a single European sky. Well, let's hope so. You also had the experience of building one of the first pan-Baltic companies, right? Uh, a, a champion not just for one country, but for the region. And as you said also, it was very important for us as a, as a new members of European Union, new European countries, to be very well connected, right? I mean, in my profession, consulting, you know, I feel it, you know, more or less every week, you know, how quickly can I get from, you know, from Riga to another point. But then if you look from inside out, uh, maybe you can talk about, you know, how, what did it take to build a truly Baltic or truly European operations for Air Baltic? Because naturally the resources of, you know, Latvia, human resources and then human resources of the Baltics, they were not enough and that's, that's natural, that's okay. But still the company is working, the company is very successful. As far as I understand, you have 62 different nationalities working for Baltic? Uh, uh, plus 30. The exact number, I don't know. But we, we have a lot yeah. of different nationalities. Yes. Yeah. So at Accenture, we have something like 40-something, so yeah. we're behind, right? Uh, and it takes also a, a different skill to manage such a multicultural uh, team. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, so the company is 27 years old already, so yeah. that is not all done by us now in the last 11 years. It has been successful founded by SAS with the help of SAS and it had different ownership structure. It grew. It grew before I came to a size which was big enough to maintain it and not let, let, just let it go. And uh, when I was called in 11 years ago, the airline was bankrupt because there were things done which led to bankruptcy. But it had already built a, a size where it was worth trying to keep it. And uh, when I started, the, the first thing was to get it out of this. Um, the, there was a lot of things wrong on the corporate governance side, but also to find a system that the airline could one day make profit again. We, we managed that. We went back into profitability. But then uh, my job was done. And uh, the next challenge came that we would need to grow and find um, find new capital. So, And there were all these waves. And, and I'm still here now uh, trying to manage the company. Uh, we developed, we, we never had a plan to be that company which we are today because we didn't serve Vilnius and Tallinn. Uh, we cancelled it before I came and we, we, we had all sorts of aircraft and it wasn't when I came the intention to have what we have today. One thing which we did and today we know that was very smart because we get the feedback, uh, we ordered an aircraft type which didn't exist at the time as the first ones and then we over the years said okay that type is so good for us Let's focus only on that aircraft type. And that enabled us then also to say, okay, with that we can long term also go back into the two neighboring states. And we started, and I remember a business plan where we said we could imagine one day to fly 11 routes point to point out of Tallinn. That was the plan I presented. We thought 11 could be a good number. Today we fly 16. So we have exceeded what we wanted to do uh, and it was developed it was developed in-house. Um, culturally, the company is a Latvian company. We speak Latvian. We, we are the national symbol of Latvia, but we are uh, speaking English only in the company, unless two Latvians speak with each other. But otherwise, the language is English. Since I'm here, and it was also the case before, uh, and people in the company come from all over the world today. We have uh, two, nearly two and a half thousand people by the end of this year, and they are professionals, mainly Latvians. Baltic people, but also a lot of uh, foreigners joining us, uh, especially now on the cabin crew side, from all over Europe and beyond. So we, we are very uh, a very diverse company, very modern. Um, I think we are the, the number one export company. I think uh, we are uh, one of the largest companies now again this year in the Baltic states. Um, so a lot of number ones we are, um, and we are inside the company I'm the boss, so it might be biased, but we have a very, very good culture 
Yeah, we, we, our people like us a lot. And uh, when we have controversial discussion in the media, which we recently had, then the people inside the company, they don't, don't like it at all. They, they're really uh, angry about it. And that, that shows that something is good inside the company because they're, they're fighting for their company. And we feel that. We employed last year 1,000 people. Um, that, that is something to do. And we did it successful. Uh, and we continue doing it this year. So culture in the company, I would, I would say, I mean, I'm biased. I'm the boss. You should ask others. But I think it's a very good culture. Is it important to have local people when you open up new routes? So if you fly into Tampere, would it be important to have uh, the, the team who also no, speaks Finnish? Finnish or? No, we have that. We, we have in our call center nine languages, which means we have also people from the different countries. But in our industry today, it is not important anymore. Because if we look at Ryanair and Visa, they are serving hundreds of destinations all over Europe. They are going in, they are going out. The passengers today accept that an airline comes in, uh, doesn't speak the local language and, and they book the tickets. So it's not a need, but mm -hmm. we want to preserve uh, this Latvian uh, national, we want to we build on it. We, we, are, we are proud of it because we are from Latvia and we are the strongest and biggest brand this country has. And why not leverage on it and combine it with Latvia? Whatever happens in Latvia, we try to somehow celebrate. There was the gold medal for the sommelier. Mm -hmm. A, oh, big, yes. a very, very big thing. It's the number one in the world. Yeah. And, and I talked yesterday to a sommelier in a restaurant and he was proud. He, it wasn't him, but, and we are proud of it. Yeah. So all these things which are around Latvia, there is not so much. We are celebrating because we are the Latvian carrier and we keep it up. We have um, Latvian food on board. Mm -hmm. We speak Latvian. Uh, we have Latvian city names, right? Mm -hmm. People in the world don't know these names of the city, Bauska, uh, Kuldiga. Uh, Lepaya. Mm -hmm. Pe people do not know in the world about these names. They haven't heard them in Dubai or wherever we go or in Marrakesh, but we put them on the aircraft. We put them in the onboard magazine. So we are basically an advertising tool for mm -hmm. Latvia and we're happy with it. So we do, it, we, do, we do this because we believe that is something we can do to strengthen our position here. But at the same time, we need to grow and we cannot focus only on Latvia because today only 25% of our revenues are generated in Latvia, 75% of the money we make, we make outside Latvia. On one side, we want to uh, take the Latvian word out and uh, you know, make sure that people know about you know, programmers from Latvia or airplanes from Latvia. But on the other side, to do that, we need to build a somewhat international business because otherwise our competition, which is coming from the other European countries, you know, would, would have an advantage. Right? So this is why it is so interesting to compare notes. Yeah, no, it's it. I mean, we are truly international yeah. because we do it every day. We this year will conduct 64,000 flights. That's like a big number. Uh, we, we will be carrying 4.4 um, million passengers in the Air Baltic network, but we're going to have another one and a half million passengers flying for others. So we have a population of 1.8 million people and carrying 6 million guests it's it's quite it's quite yes. a number and it's, it's growing so it's an achievement, yes. yeah it's 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 pretty big company now uh, it's very well run with the most modern air, aircraft in the world um, so we are we are super proud and I'm, I'm not stopping talking about it my people are also very proud and and i think a lot of the latvians when they fly on us are also proud that we are the national carrier just in the local media sometimes we are uh, not getting the the right attention for different reasons but the people flying, uh, coming on board when we are somewhere in the world and you, ca you get on board finally if you've been two weeks out in Marrakesh in Dubai and then somebody says, Labrit, that's what, is, what, what we are. And uh, every Latvian is so happy when he gets after the holiday back on board of an Air Baltic aircraft and you see it and you feel it. And this we want to preserve. Mm. Yeah? But not to forget that we have 70% of our income now generated outside Latvia. But why not make Latvian hospitality and the Latvian way of life be the icon of what Air Baltic is? There's no limitations to take the, the, the Latvian way bigger. There's no limit. Mm. We don't have to limit ourselves here. We can, we can do this somewhere else and say this is how Latvia does it. Because we have a global brand established which comes from Latvia and, and mm. it works. So we, we will continue because our plan is to grow further and take that Latvian way of doing it uh, out to the world and we do because we fly to Dubai every day and th there is a Latvian aircraft landing and uh, and taking not only Latvians to and from Dubai. Talking about being proud I think you were one of the first ones to start uh, selling tickets on blockchain. 
Yes. And it was something like just about 10 years ago. Yeah, we, we sold uh, with Bitcoin first, 2014. Uh, we were the first one. And uh, yeah, we're not selling too much. But yeah. today we have a couple of cryptocurrencies you can use to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. That's technology. We always like tech affine company. We had the most modern aircraft. Now we bring a Starlink satellite mm -hmm. system on board. We have an NFT as a frequent flyer program integration. Oh. We also try to, because Latvia is also a tech country, we try to, to use the local knowledge, the ideas, and mm. integrate them in our business where they make sense. And also interesting, because we get, I'm speaking in, in conferences uh, all over the world. I was in Silicon Valley talking about Air Baltic's uh, uh, NFT and blockchain experience. Uh, I was invited there. So that is, a, and I always say, I'm coming from Latvia, and then I explain where it is. And I'm proud, I'm happy to present, and people give the feedback, whoa, cool company. Yeah. So internationally, the company has a very strong name now. So I mean, if we kind of compare what you thought you would be able to do with, with Bitcoin, and then I think 10 years ago, all of us kind of expected that this would you know, develop in a sense that you know, many more people potentially would buy those tickets today, right? So how do you see this kind of going forward? Do you see that this has a, an agenda for you or is it something that it, was an important experiment but probably can stop there? Um, we, look, we looked at it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had, like everybody else, the hope that that would develop faster, bigger. But we would not put too much resources in any of these things we do because they can only be something which develops. And if it develops, it gets the attention. Mm -hmm. But the key focus for us is generating revenue to match the, um, the cost. Mm -hmm. yeah, because our industry doesn't make big profit margins. We need to go back into profit now. Mm -hmm. And th that is the key focus. If there is something like the satellite system coming now, there will be the next revolution for us probably coming. So once it's installed, there's a lot of uh, things happening around it uh, because SpaceX and, and Starlink are making headlines on their own and we'll make them on top of it as the first carrier mm -hmm. having it on board here in Europe. There might be then more we can do, but on the blockchain front, we are now more on the frequent flyer program that develops. Let's see how, how that goes. On the cur blockchain currencies, I think we will have CBDCs, so, so currencies which will be issued by the by Europe, by, uh, they, they will bring crypto uh, money in the future. I do believe that the euro one day will be a cryptic uh, uh, payment. And then we already have the way of how to deal with it. So we learned uh, with that. But uh, we would not put too much effort on now saying, OK, we need to push people to pay with crypto because the acceptance is today not as it could be. It might come when the states, when Europe, when, when others, uh, China has their cryptocurrency now. When, 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 the, when they say there is a payment with crypto, uh, we know how technically it works. And then when there's a mass adoption, I think then you would put more effort in. And about NFT, so do you plan to have secondary market for frequent flyer and NFT? So how do you see that developing? We, we have announced it and it still takes two weeks, but mm -hmm. we have already transitioned to have um, the possibility to get the top tier program, the VIP status, by owning 25 of our NFTs. So if you own 25 of the NFTs, you automatically are a VIP member in our frequent flyer program, as long as you stake them, as long as you mm. keep them in the frequent flyer program. That meaning uh, you reduce the availability in the market and that uh, increases the value of them. Uh, on top of it, you get a lot of points. It works because since we did that, uh, it picks up. Um, we have sold more than 4,000 and the majority of them are now frequent flyers and they are collecting points. So it works. But again, it is something on the side because the frequent flyer program is at the end of the day a loyalty program which where the customers benefit and we benefit from frequent flyers repurchasing a ticket more often than somebody who is not a frequent flyer. That, that's why you have these programs. Uh, they give benefit to the customer, but they also give us the benefit because the loyal customer returns. And if we make the frequent flyer program better, uh, the customers, of course, will benefit from it and then fly even more on us. And how do you think this will change the behavior of customers? So is it the same type of a loyalty approach or would it be... It's, it's a new way because we are combining blockchain with a loyalty program. Nobody has done that in our industry. 
uh, we will see and learn from it. There's no cost for us, it's only an upside because we are selling the NFT, which means we are having income. The, the customer gets points which he can redeem against cash or a flight. So for us, it is a technology development where we see, mm -hmm. and, and we cannot say today where we're gonna be in three years, but we, we stay open to it. Same with ChatGPT, which now came AI. We are using it in several areas mm -hmm. in the company, but we don't know where it goes. We stay open. But all of this, which we do as, as a now a large company, also very tech driven, we need to always evaluate, is this really making our business better or are we are playing somewhere on the side, something which has no future? There was an app a while ago called Clubhouse and everybody said that yes. app yeah, and then it disappeared. For six months. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we don't want to, we don't want to focus on something which is not developing further. So therefore we are looking at everything. We're very innovative, but we are not giving it too much attention un unless we see, okay, this is really something where, which adds to our business. And on the NFT side, on the loyalty program, the, the, the planies as they are called, that works now because there we are in, in the pro on the profit side and each time somebody engages there, uh, Baltic benefits from it. So that is something which works. To what extent? Um, now the top tier program is technically an NFT. Um, you, so you, you can get that top tier by just buying uh, yourself an NFT, which means you can buy yourself the top tier loyalty card. Uh, that is new. Uh, and uh, we will see the response to that. Uh, it, it, there was a press release about it. Technically, it will be mm -hmm. in two weeks time. And then uh, there will be a group of customers who say, yeah, I, I want to have that top tier. I need it for a month and now I'm selling it again. Mm -hmm. There will be a market and we will see how, how, how that plays out. And it's really important to experiment because I mean, we don't know how it's going to develop. Yeah. But, but I think you're right there. Baltic is one of the first ones. Well, the first air company, uh, Starbucks is doing the same thing in, in their space. And then maybe we could talk a little bit about the apps because there was a moment five, seven years ago when all of their uh, air companies experimented with the apps. Uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, the feeling is that, you know, you didn't really find how mobile apps or help yeah. the company. So what is your perception as the CEO? I would love to have a mobile app today, which is better than the one we have because ours was developed out of one we had for the frequent flyer program, which transitioned mm -hmm. into the one we have today. Technically, from the functionality, there are better apps, but I would love to have an app because a lot of frequent flyers like to use apps with airlines. Then we go back to who are our customers because of we are growing in, in many markets, uh, not so many passengers are frequent travelers. So therefore, there the app is not helpful because if you book once, you're not downloading the app. But for the future, we do believe an app is something you need because the frequent flyers are using apps. When Web3 comes now, we, we, we're looking at that as well. What is, what, is, what is changing for us selling on the web a ticket in Web3? I don't know. Maybe then the apps are not important anymore. But right now, it, we have an app, but uh, I would love to have a better technology. But it's not easy. You cannot, in, in the, it's very complex, uh, the, our systems which we have in the background. And to have all of them integrated in the app as they are on the, on the normal front on the web uh, is very complicated and, and, and takes time. We have a very good website and the technique behind it. But to have that in the app is a, is a very complex uh, uh, technical solution which takes time. So we're improving the app as, as months by months, but we are not having the app and you can download it and it's like the web. So today mm. we are still better being uh, on the web. You have more functionality there than in the app. And why is it so difficult to have the app? Because it because interfaces of, all of those systems in the background? Yes, or? All the, we, there's uh, in an airline many, many systems linking with each other. There's the system where you book, where you host uh, the inventory, the, uh, but then there's also the system which you need for the check-in. Uh, and the processing of the passenger mm. once the passenger is arriving uh, at the airport or checking in. And uh, even that is several systems which need to um, be linked. And they are linked today. When you come to the airport, you have a seamless travel. Mm -hmm. But in the app, you need to build com complete new um, technology mm -hmm. to, to, to connect it. We have a lot of it, mm -hmm. but we are not where there's better apps in the world than our Baltics app. Mm. Thank you for coming in and sharing all of those insights. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Thank yeah. you.